and welcome to Southland. Didn't the choir do a great job this morning? We're always blessed to have such a great group of people who enjoy music and want to glorify God with their voices. And we'd love to have you join us. Rehearsals are Sunday at 4.30 p.m. in the Worship Center. Choir is more than just a place to sing. It's a great way to make new friends and have a meaningful impact on our worship experience. If this is your first time at our church, we're glad you joined us for the classic worship. We'd love a chance to welcome you in person and get to know you better. Please take a moment to stop by our welcome desk in the hub after the service. There you can meet with one of our leadership team members and ask any questions you may have about our church. For those of you online, we're glad you connected with us today through our live stream. Please use the chat window to let us know that you're worshiping with us or to ask any questions about our church. We'll respond as quickly as we can. Christmas is right around the corner and we need your help to prepare Operation Christmas Child boxes. We have two events coming up this month. First, a kit assembly workshop on October 9th to help organize previously donated items. And second, a shoebox packing party on October 23rd. We are asking for you to sign up for the workshop on the 9th, but the packing party on the 23rd is open to all comers. More information and the sign up form can be found on the events page of our website. It may be the beginning of October, but Thanksgiving isn't that far away. The Refuge is once again providing Thanksgiving meals for those they serve, 
and they've asked us to help collect powdered mashed potatoes as part of that meal. Donations can be left in the bins next to the missions table through November 14th. We have two other great events in October that you will want to get on your calendar. The weekend of October 23rd, we have a men's tailgate party with special guest Kent Chevalier, the chaplain of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the weekend of October 30th, we have a trunk or treat planned for the kids. Both are great opportunities to invite friends, neighbors, and coworkers to Southland. More details are coming soon, but we wanted to get both events on your calendars early. This morning, we are excited to welcome special guest Keith Kateski, who will be looking at Mourner's Encounter with Jesus in the story of Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. They knew Jesus could have healed Lazarus, but he arrived too late. In two very important one-on-one -on -one conversations, Jesus showed both Mary and Martha who he was and his amazing power over life and death. So as our worship team comes to lead us this morning, let's ask the Lord to show us something new today. We're glad you're here. We are glad that you're here. Would you stand with us together? Let's sing this song together, please. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. And every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of God who comes to say He's here to set the captives free Who can stop the Lord Almighty Our God is the light The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb for the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. Who oh, can stop the Lord? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? Stop the Lord of 
chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. appreciation as well. He would tell you that God answered your prayers and uh, his surgery went well and he is recovering well. We want to continue to pray for him though because uh, the doctors say the worst is yet to come as far as uh, how the healing takes place and uh, some pain that is to come. So continue to lift him up. He is so grateful for all of the cards and messages and the way that you have encouraged him uh, this past week. Thank you very much. 
since he is gone, we are a privilege to have Keith Koteski with us today. Keith and his wife, Leanne, who is with him, uh, are in South Bend in the area there. Keith has pastored. Keith has done missionary work in various places around the world. Keith has uh, uh, planted churches and currently is a professor of Christian ministries at Bethel University in Mishawaka, if I said that correctly. Um, when I met Keith uh, back in 2003, just uh, as an acquaintance, I never had any idea that he would not only become my boss, but one of the dearest friends that I have ever had. We worked together at Avalon Missionary Church for, for quite a while. How he kept me on staff, I'm not sure. I loved to watch uh, when he would leave his office to, to use the restroom, and I would hide in a little cubby outdoors, and every time he came by, I would jump out and scare him. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 tell, I, I saw in his face one day that that was probably the last time I should do that. <laughs> But well, we are glad he is here. I have always loved the way Keith is able to break open the word and make it clear, practical, and relevant for our lives. <clears throat> Let's pray together today. <clears throat> Father God, you are an awesome God. And it is so great today to lift up our voices and declare that you are the Lion of Judah. You are the God who saves. And we each thank you from the bottoms of our heart for the salvation that you have made available to us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the ways that we have seen your hands at work throughout this week. Many people have testified to your healing power. Many have testified to the encouragement that you have brought to them through your spirit. Many have, have already given testimony of how they have sensed you when they received some very tough news this week. They've talked about how you have made your presence known to them in the midst of their grief. How blessed are we to be called your children and to receive the good gifts that you shower on us. It's been a tough week for some, Lord, and so we pray today that you would continue to make your presence known to them that you would continue to provide everything that is needed in the lives of people that are hurting and grieving and sick and discouraged. Be everything to them that they need you to be. We thank you for this servant who comes to bring the word today. We ask for your anointing to rest on him, but most of all, help us to push away all the distractions so that your spirit can speak clearly into our hearts today. We need your word. We want to hear your word. We thank you for your word. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, you have believed in vain. For what I have received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. Would you sing this with us, please? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Thank 
Some say hope is a dangerous thing, that it gives us a false sense of assurance, that it gives us a crutch to rely upon. The more we hope, the more we could be disappointed. But what if our hope is not in a circumstance, or a diagnosis, or a prayer? What if our hope is in a person? A person who's over every circumstance. A person who sees every diagnosis. A person who hears every prayer. For we hope in the person who can command seas to be still. We hope in the person who can turn water into wine. We hope in the all-powerful, all-knowing, never-sleeping, always-moving miracle worker who sees every heart, who knows every desire, who is a very present help in the hour of our need. Hope is dangerous, but not for us. Hope is dangerous for every sickness, every injustice. Dangerous for every habit, every addiction. Dangerous because our God has conquered death and sin. Dangerous because our God has left the grave behind. All authority under heaven and earth is given to him in whom we have hope. Hope is dangerous because our hope has a name, Jesus. Do you believe that, my friends? You really believe that? Isn't that an awesome thing? And we want to explore that together this morning as we look together at John chapter 11. So I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11 with me this morning as we continue the series that you've been on uh, face to face and We get the chance to explore that together this morning. It's so good to be with you. Uh, We have a number of friends who are in this area. It's great to be back with Pastor Kerry. I'm honored um, uh, to have Pastor Steve invite me to to share from God's Word with you today. Honored to have Pastor Steve as a friend and a colleague in uh, in ministry and so many others. I won't name all the people because, frankly, you don't care who all I know, right? But uh, but it is so good. Already this morning I've seen some folks as we were driving through town this morning we were reminiscing because we did live here at one point in this area, and it kind of brought back all kinds of good uh, memories. So you've already caught a glimpse of what I had to endure when Pastor Kerry worked on my staff team at Avalon Missionary Church. The fun continues as I was getting ready to come up this morning. He leaned over and said, don't trip. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> 
Um, I sort of walked out of the bathroom this morning just a little fearful of, uh, of what I might face in, uh, in all of this. But we had many great adventures together in the time that we worked together. Um, Pastor Kerry is truly one of the great uh, friends that I've had, and he's left an indelible mark on our family. My children, my children's lives uh, were deeply impacted, and I should say for the good, in, uh, in Kerry's ministry with us, both as their children's pastor at the time, and, uh, and then later just as a friend, or we think of him honestly as, uh, as family. We had lots of adventures together. Many of you would know Pastor Kerry's heart. Uh, for those who are in need. And one day in the church office there at the church in Fort Wayne, a man came in. He seemed, um, he seemed just a little different and upset about some things. He, he gave us uh, some account of how something had happened to his car, and he needed someone to give him a ride to the house. It was either his house or a, a sister's house or something like that. And Pastor Kerry said, I'll, I'll give you a ride. He said, I'm happy to take you. And I just was a little concerned about what uh, kind of what Maybe there was some danger involved in what Pastor Kerry had to share. And so I said, I said to him, I said, would you, would you like me to go along? And he's like, no, no, I'll be all right. I'm like, okay, all right. So, so the two of them take off, and I'm back at my desk. And just a few minutes later, my cell phone rings, and I see on the caller ID that it's Kerry. And, and I said, hey, dude, what's up? And he said, Keith, he's got a knife. <laughs> Long pause. I'm, I'm a gut punch. I'm like, oh, I should have gone. I should have gone. And, uh, and I said, well, where are you? Tell me where you are. I'll call 911. Tell me where you are. He's like, Keith, I don't know what to do. I'm like, I'm panicking. I am just, I'm beside myself, right, about what's going on. And then finally, he just busts up laughing. He's like, <laughs> he said, I knew you were a little concerned, so I thought I'd have some fun with you. I'm like, dude, <laughs> dude, you cannot do that to me. So if I look a little older than I'm supposed to be this morning, uh, a lot of that is due to uh, my experiences with my good friend, Pastor Kerry in all of that, but truly, truly good to be with you all, um, to be with many of you that we know, and it's, uh, it's a delight. But let's look together in uh, John chapter 11 as we explore this encounter that Martha and Mary have with their good friend, uh, Jesus. Many of you would know this story. It's a, fam- it's a familiar one to many of you. I would suggest to you that familiarity sometimes can be a danger for us, that we sometimes tend to read over some of those details we might otherwise have noted. The story begins in chapter 11 with uh, Lazarus, who was a good friend of Jesus, falling ill. And apparently this was more than just a cold. It was more than something that wasn't uh, wasn't too serious. It was very serious. So that Martha and Mary actually send word to Jesus a couple of days away that your dear friend is how they describe Lazarus has fallen ill, and they're wanting Jesus to come. This is, this is emergency time. This is a time when Jesus can come and perhaps heal him, but Jesus delays a bit. Jesus pauses. He doesn't just get up and scurry off. He pauses. He says a few things to his disciples about how God will be glorified in what is about to happen here, and eventually, which seems a bit troubling, but Eventually, Jesus makes his way to the town of Bethany a couple of miles outside of the city of Jerusalem. And we pick up the story in verse 17 this morning, John chapter 11, beginning of verse 17, where John tells us that on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, oh, I I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world And after she had said this, she went back and she called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. And when Mary 
heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, <laughs> those same words, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Would you pray with me? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, and we are the clay. In Christ's name, amen. amen. That word, if, that can be a very discouraging kind of word, can it? If, if you had. If you had, if only, that's one of those words that we often pair with if when we use that phrase, and maybe some of you have used that phrase before, if only, if only we had gotten here sooner before they ran out of donuts, <laughs> sense a little bit about what's important to me, right? Or if only chocolate didn't come with so many calories, if only, right? And those are some humorous examples, but as we say those... We're also mindful that many of us have often used those same couple of words to capture a desperation that's a deeper down and farther back, right? If, if only often concedes an element of loss, usually serious and desperate loss, and that's certainly the case in this story with Martha and Mary who engage Jesus in these conversations, and both of these women, great, as the, and great friends of Jesus as they are, when they first encounter Jesus in the story, that's the first thing they say, Lord, if you had been here. Martha says it in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, then my brother would not have died. There's a bit of an edge to that, isn't there? Although if we, if we take seriously what Martha says to Jesus in the conversation, it's, it's not an anger, it's not a bitterness, it's just this resignation that there's been loss here that perhaps would not have happened if Jesus had been on the scene. There's a sense of desperation in her voice, a, a sense of, of resignation in what is there, the recognition that a possibility that she had longed for has been lost. Mary repeats the exact same phrase, and it's even the same in the Greek language with a slight alteration in word order. Lord, verse 32, Lord, if, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Two women Two conversations with Jesus, both of which happen in this context of the sense of the loss of something that they believed perhaps could, not, uh, could have been avoided. Many of us can identify with that. Many of you can think of moments over the years when something has happened and you thought to yourself, if, if only... If only someone had done this, if only God had intervened in some other kind of way, if, if only, in, and even maybe thinking about that brings up some of the pain that's been a part of that, maybe some of us have even said that this week. Lord, if only. We feel that sense of loss, which means that we should find it quite easy to identify with Martha and Mary and their face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus in this moment, their good friend. So let's, let's look first at Martha's encounter, right? Martha, um, very consistent with Luke's portrayal of her in, uh, in another of Jesus' visits to their home. Martha's right there to meet him when he comes into town. And after she, after she gets out this sense of resignation and desperation, the conversation then turns to the fact that Martha believes there's still a possibility that Jesus might be able to do something, right? Lord, if only you had been here, but, 
But I still believe that God might, God might do something if you asked him to do that. There might be something, and I'm not quite sure exactly what it is that she thought, if perhaps she thought resurrection would be a part of that, but, but she does believe that maybe Jesus could do something, but she's pretty confident that the opportunity for a grand miracle has likely passed. I mean, Jesus was, after all, the one who was able to give sight to a blind man, something that they understood that only God could do, but it had been, John tells us, more than four days since Lazarus had been laid in the tomb. Jewish rabbis had taught that when a person died, his or her soul actually lingered around the body, around the grave, hoping for an opportunity to re-enter the body, but after three days, after decomposition had settled in, Jewish rabbis believed that there wasn't any opportunity for the soul to re-enter the body then. The soul then was understood to depart for good. So that little detail that John gives us of four days is significant in this story. Really, any hope that Martha or the other mourners who had come from Jerusalem had that, that Lazarus could be raised from the dead really had been set aside. It was not a good situation for their brother and friend, Lazarus, or, or was it? <laughs> That's what Martha thought, perhaps, and she reaches out and wants Jesus to do something, and so Jesus does speak a word of confident hope for her. Your brother will rise again, and Martha is a good student of theology. She has her eschatology down. She knows that, yes, Lord, in the, in the great resurrection in that day, he will rise again on that last day. In verse 24, but Jesus, Jesus intends to use this conversation to help her see something beyond just her brother's situation, but something about who Jesus is. The conversation that they have is really not about the logistics of the miracle or what needs to be done. Jesus will solve that issue a little bit later on, but Jesus looks to her in verses 25 and 26 and speaks words that are revelatory about who He is. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he says to her, do you believe this? Do you believe this? It's easy for us to read through those words and miss some of the nuance that Martha no doubt would have captured immediately, even with the first couple of words, when Jesus says, I am. In the Greek, Ego a me. You can go impress your friends at lunch today with your intense knowledge of the Greek language, right? But she would have recognized those words as the Hebrew words that Jesus, that God used actually to, to give his personal name to the people who would follow him, the Israelites. If we go all the way back to Exodus chapter 3, when God is calling Moses to lead the people of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt and fashioning them as his chosen people through whom all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. And Moses says, well, who do I tell your people has sent me? God says, simply tell them, I am. John picks that up, actually, in the way that he writes his gospel. It's a beautiful thing. There are good seven points at which Jesus says, I am. Actually, in John's gospel, Jesus uses those same words more than just those seven times, but there's seven times in which there's an object after that, a, a, a nominative that describes something about who God is. When Jesus said to Martha, I am, he was making a claim that's far beyond what most of us understand initially. I am was a statement of his divine nature. Before her stood the very God of the universe, the creator, the author of life itself. Jesus was telling Martha something about who he was. Jesus is God. Jesus is the author of life. Jesus is the only one who could ever bring resurrection. Jesus was God before her. In her midst, her friend, the one whom she knew intimately. I'm reminded as I read this story of the account the gospel writers also tell of the father of the demon-possessed son who comes along and the disciples of Jesus can't, 
They, they, they just can't cast out this demon. They had been casting out demons right and left, but for some reason, this one was tougher, and the father is there before Jesus in his desperation. Mark tells it in chapter 9 of his gospel, and, and he looks at Jesus, and he says, if you can do anything, have mercy on us and help us. And Jesus looks back at him, and I kind of imagine the scene with a bit of a smile on his face, and he says, if you can, <laughs> if, if you can, there's that word again, if you can. He is the author of life. He is the resurrection. That's, that's a key point here from Martha's conversation with Jesus. Jesus' declaration reveals his divine nature and hence his powerful capability. Jesus' declaration here is a statement about what God can do, about God as the one who brings life in in the broadest form of those terms. It establishes a confidence of faith. Jesus himself can bring life in this moment. And in faith, we live in that confidence and hope. We need to know that Jesus, who lives in us by his Holy Spirit, is Son of God. He is a reminder. He is the one who reminds us here of what God can do. That's why our theology is so important. What we know of God, we know that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's creator. He's the author of life, and God is active in this moment for Martha, in this moment for Lazarus, and as we'll see in a moment, in this moment for Mary. But is it possible that sometimes as we find ourselves in difficult, desperate circumstances, we just forget a little bit about what it is that God can do. I think of a great classic book by J.B. Phillips that was important in my understanding of God. It's titled, Your God is Too Small. And, uh, and I commend it to you. It's a, it's a reminder for us of the teachings of the Word about who God really is. It's so easy for us to limit our perceptions of who God is and what God is capable of doing, especially in those desperate kind of moments when we face the specter of death itself. Reminds me of a story, of a story that the great preaching professor Fred, Cra Fred Craddock used to tell about a young pastor who was new in the community, and he went to the hospital to pray with an older woman. He was told she's near death. She's in the hospital, lying on a pillow, gasping for breath, and so he walks into her room, and uh, he, uh, he says to the woman after visiting with her for a bit, well, I probably should be going now, um, but I'd like to have a prayer for you before I leave. How could I pray for you today? And the old woman looked at him, and she said, well, that would be great. She said, I'd like you to pray that I would be healed, of course. And the young pastor gasped in the moment and thought, well, maybe she doesn't realize how, how serious this situation is. I mean, even the medical staff have said she's near death, but he thought, well, we'll give it a shot just the same, right? So he begins to pray, Lord, we pray for your sustaining presence with this sick sister, and if it be thy will, we pray that she would be restored to health and to service, but if it's not thy will, we certainly hope that she will adjust to her circumstances. And as Craddock tells the story, suddenly the old woman opened her eyes, and she sat up there in the bed. She threw her feet over the side of the bed, and she stood up with actually strength that surprised him, and she looked at him, and she said, I think, I think I'm healed. And she walked out the door of her room to go down and talk to the nurses at the nurse's station saying, look, look at me, and they were shocked. It was not at all what they would have expected, and the pastor later left and went out to the parking lot and just before he opened the door of his car, he kind of looked up and he said, don't you ever do that to me again. <laughs> Even pastors sometimes, right, want to limit what they believe God can do. Now, I'm mindful that God doesn't always act in the ways that we would want, and we're mindful that some of that we'll only understand, I believe, someday in eternity. But how often do we limit what we believe God can do by not recognizing God's power, 
A number of years ago, I was in Ecuador with my brother Bill over here. We were building a second story on a church building in a little town called Naranjito in the, uh, in the coast there of Ecuador. And we, were, uh, we, were, we ended work early on a Wednesday night because they were going to have a service of worship at the church. And we sat in on the service. And I didn't understand really anything that went on in the service. I don't speak a whole lot of Spanish. I've picked up uh, a bit here and there in my, uh, in my travels. But I, I didn't really know what was going on. It sounded like the pastor's sermon was really good. It was at least spirited as a sermon, and I trusted that it was in uh, faithful, uh, it was faithful to God's Word in the moment. And as the pastor finished his sermon, he, uh, he, he gave an invitation for people to come forward. I could recognize that that was kind of going on in the moment. And, and, uh, and so we prayed then as he was praying, and, and, um, and then people started coming forward to be anointed with oil and prayed for for healing. And uh, the missionary who was leading, uh, hosting our team there tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, Keith, you need to understand that it would be a cultural expectation here by the pastor that since you're a pastor, that you would also anoint people with oil and pray for them. And I got this panicked look on my face, and I turned around, and I said, John, I don't know Spanish. And he said, it's all right, Keith. God knows English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> John had a way of doing that to me. And so I prayed for them in English. He said, Keith, these people, they, they, they don't care if they understand what you're saying. They just want you to pray for them. They want God's power in their life. And, uh, and I understood in maybe a humorous way and in a small way how easy it is for us, even pastors, to begin to think in a limited perspective about what a God who is the resurrection and life can do in circumstances that we're in. Which is why Jesus ends his brief conversation face-to-face here with Martha with that simple question I started with today. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you really believe this? Because when we really believe this, it changes how we live. We live in a confidence. We live with a sense of anticipation of what God is going to do in the moment. We live with a hope that the video talked about earlier today that that we saw together. And so my question for you this morning would be, do, do you believe this? Or perhaps Martha can be our reminder today of that. But then she goes and gets Mary. And she lets Mary know that Jesus, the teacher, the rabbi, is here in, uh, in town. And so Mary, we're told, rushes off. She leaves with haste. And so all of the mourners who had come from Jerusalem uh, follow her out. Mary, Mary is a reminder here in this story of the tender intimacy that we see of Jesus with all of these people. These were his friends, Lazarus, the women had described as the one whom you love when they sent for Jesus, and now Jesus has come to be with his dear friends in a moment of desperate loss. There were lots of people there mourning and crying. To to those of us who live in the United States in our day, that seems a little odd. Uh, Our mourning is often a private affair. It's often something we do just with people that we have the closest of friendships with, but in the culture of this time and in their day, in their place, um, that would have been something you did very publicly, and people would have come, and, and mourners like this likely would have gathered for about seven days to mourn publicly with Martha and with Mary over the loss of, uh, of Lazarus. And, and so they've come, and they're weeping, and they follow Mary out. They think, John tells us, that she's going to the tomb to do more of her grieving uh, there. And so they follow her out, and there's all of this weeping. And actually, the verb that is used to describe what they're doing here carries this connotation of loud weeping. This would have been not kind of just a quiet thing. They're, they're crying out. The, the gut-wrenching sense of loss and grief is pouring out in a very public way. And yet, with his conversation here, we see a tenderness to Jesus. In fact, it's hard in some ways to label it a conversation, isn't it? Because Mary simply says that line that we, mo- we, we looked at earlier, if, if you had been here, Lord, my brother would not have died, and then she's just there at the feet of Jesus, weeping. In verse 33, Jesus tells us, or John tells us rather, that when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. 
And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. I always liked that line, Jesus wept. If you were having to memorize a certain number of verses of Scripture, it was always handy to have that one in the back pocket, right? Always got John chapter 11, verse 35. It's interesting to me that whoever it was, I believe it was a Frenchman some four or five hundred years ago who was dividing up the, uh, the Scriptures into verses. It's interesting to me that, that he designated just that simple statement as one verse. Most verses are a, a good sentence, at least in the way that we describe it in English, but one here for the weeping of Jesus. What is it that would cause Jesus in this moment to weep? After all, Jesus has already said something about the fact that, that he will rise again, right? That Jesus already knows. Like, like, Jesus is not thinking in this story, if we take the context seriously, that Lazarus is gone for good. So it's not over the loss of Lazarus. What could it be? In our English language, it's easy for us to find obscured here a key difference because Mary is described as weeping and the Jews are also described as weeping. This is a loud crying. It's a gut-wrenching. And some of you, I've been there, man. There have been moments in my life, when, typically in moments of grief, when it's that crying that you can't stop, that crying that comes from deep within, and, uh, and there have been seasons in my life where that has been true. But the word that is used to describe the weeping of Jesus is actually a different word. It's not a word that connotes this idea of loud crying. It's a gentler. It's a gentler form. It's, it marks an element of grief and sadness, but it's informed by the description John gives us just before that of Jesus' response, notice, to the scene before him. He sees the anguish. He sees the pain that these people are experiencing and their response to that with this loud weeping so that John tells us he was deeply moved in spirit. It's a word that's used everywhere else to connote this idea of a deep-seated anger. There's a, a sense of indignation here. There's a sense almost of outrage in the heart of Jesus, and he pairs that, John does, with the word troubled. Jesus is troubled, hurt, by the scene of anguish and pain and grief and loss that he sees before him. Jesus sees the pain and the grief that death has caused. He sees the, the hurt that people feel, and there's an element of compassion that flows from that, of righteous indignation, of the ways that the specter of death has, has caused such a response in people. And there may even be a sense of frustration with the people who who can't quite believe in this moment, right? Who are struggling to respond in the confidence and the hope that they could have. And as Jesus sees that scene, he weeps. Grant Osborne describes it this way, Jesus was overcome with the scene and its futility, with the terrible specter of death hanging over God's people, and the fact that the mourners were overcome with it rather than trusting in the one who is life itself. But one of the beautiful things for me in this scene is that we get a beautiful picture here of the humanity of Jesus. That's critical in all of John's gospel. Jesus was not just son of God. Jesus was son of God who was both God and human. Jesus' tears here reveal his human nature and in it also his compassionate motivation. It's a reminder for us or a revelation for us of what, why God acts as he does, why God intervenes as he does, why God invites us to have faith in the one who is the author of life. In this profoundly human Jesus in this story, we're reminded that God is not aloof, God is not distant. God is not unmoved. God is not uncaring. God's heart is not unmoved by the cries of his people. In fact, some standing there look at Jesus in the moment and see the compassion and say, see how he loved him. The love of God, the compassion of God, the mercy of God is on clear display here. In both of these conversations that Jesus has face to face with Martha and Mary, 
in the face of Christ here, we see both the limitless power and the costly compassion of God exquisitely revealed. I love that combination. The omnipotent, all-powerful God and the, and the caring, compassionate, my heart is deeply moved God, brought together in one. And when we're in those moments of desperation, when we're in those moments when we cry out, we desperately want hope in what we're experiencing to know that God cares matters so much. A number of years ago, this was a number of years ago because our kids are grown and away from home, but it was between the birth of our two children. We were traveling in the country of Canada with family, and at the time, Leanne kind of in the moment was experiencing a miscarriage. We were losing the, uh, the second child that we had hoped for and dreamed for in all that was there. And I remember this moment when I just wanted someone to care Right? We, were, we were traveling, we were in the airport on our way back to a, a returning home, and it was a busy, I believe it was uh, maybe the Minneapolis-St. Paul airport, it was a busy airport, people going everywhere as they do in, uh, in airports, and we were feeling the pain of, uh, of this loss in our life, of death, right? And, uh, and I, it seemed like nobody noticed, right? All these people scurrying places, and I don't hold them responsible, but there was that human part of me that just wanted to stand up on the chair in the middle of the airport and say, you all, doesn't anybody care about this? Doesn't, don't you know what's going on in our lives? We're hurting. Thankfully, I didn't do that. I might have been ushered out by security or something else, but it was one of those moments of desperation and loss. When the knowledge that someone, the God, the almighty God of the universe, notices that his heart is moved, that his heart cares, someone this morning needs to be reminded of that from the tears of Jesus before Mary. You know how the story ends. You know that Jesus calls on them to take away the stone. Jesus looks up into heaven and he thanks God for the fact that God has heard him, that God always hears him, and then he says those words, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man comes out, his hands and feet wrapped still with the strips of linen, a cloth around his face, and Jesus instructs them to take off the clothes. There are all kinds of ways that this should make a difference in our lives. It certainly shapes how we live in a confidence and a hope, even in the face of death itself. Paul would say later on in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Even when we do face the specter of death, there is a confidence and a hope that we serve a Savior who is the resurrection, and the life. This story is a helpful reminder of us, of both the pain and the reality of that grief that even moves the heart of Jesus himself, and yet the power of a God who acts in those kinds of circumstances. A few years ago, I got to see that lived out before me, that kind of confidence, that kind of hope as I walked through the dying, dying process with my friend Carl in Fort Wayne. We had a deep, deep friendship. It was forged in some very difficult times. We had walked through a lot together, and you don't want to know all of those kind of details. But finally, the news came one day that the cancer that Carl had had some 15 years before was back. And they tried everything they tried some chemo treatments. That didn't seem to make any difference. They did a, a, some kind of stem cell transplant. I was actually down here in the Indianapolis area multiple times visiting with my friend Carl. That's an agonizing, painful uh, act of suffering to go through that. But the hope was maybe, maybe that would finally do the trick. And it didn't take too long after that process had been completed that it became clear that at least from a medical point of view, there really wasn't much else that could be done. But that didn't phase the faith of my friend Carl. He viewed that as an opportunity simply to 
something to look forward to, not, not ignoring the pain that he was feeling, not ignoring the suffering, but there was an element of hope and confidence in the midst of that. And so as my brother Carl was dying, he was in the hospice home for seven weeks. <laughs> That's a long time in the hospice home. Usually it's maybe two days, maybe three but we would often have conversations. I would go out and sit with Carl, and we would talk about his faith. We would talk about the difference that Christ had made in his life. And trust me, it was a huge difference. Carl was a changed man because he had experienced the grace of Jesus. And as Carl lay in the bed in that hospice home for seven weeks, each day different people from church would come by, and Carl would minister to them. So many of us would come by thinking that we had come to minister to him in his process, and we would walk away discovering that God was using him. In the very face of death, he really believed that Jesus was his resurrection in life, that Jesus had brought him new life in the, the pits of despair that he had been in earlier, and that Jesus was giving him life even as he was dying and that he would spend eternity with Jesus, who is the resurrection in life. On the night before he died, I stopped by to visit my friend Carl one more time. I didn't know at the time that it would be the only, the last time. But we went out, and on that night, I knew it was getting close. Carl didn't have much strength left. He could hardly talk. If he said a word, it was a whisper. It was about all he could do. So I sat in a chair behind, beside his bed, and I held his hand, and we watched the Cincinnati Reds play baseball. <laughs> Carl was a huge baseball fan and a huge Cincinnati fan, so we shared that. We just sat there, and we watched baseball for about a half hour, and then I could tell he was weary, and it was time for me to go. So I said, Carl, I want to pray for you, and I took his hand, and I, I prayed for him. And as I said amen, I squeezed his hand, and I went to let go. And with what strength he had left, he wouldn't let go of my hand. And he said, I'm going to pray for you. And he began to pray in that whispered tone with every ounce of strength he had left. It was perhaps the most beautiful prayer anyone has ever prayed over me and my family and my ministry. I've had a lot of people pray for me over the years. Tears were streaming down my face, tears down his as I watched a man who was facing the specter of death closer than I ever have, minister to me and to many others in the moment. He became for me in that time a living illustration of someone who lived in the confidence, who really believed <laughs> what Martha was asked, who really believed that his Jesus was the resurrection and the life. That's the kind of confidence I believe God can give each one of us. And some of us today need to hear that. And I think all of us need to be challenged with that question. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this, Keith? Do you believe this? Let's pray together. Lord, you know well the suffering and the challenges that we face. And in fact, not only do you know it, but your heart is moved by it. We thank you for the reminder of who you are in the face-to-face -face encounters that both Martha and Mary had with Jesus. And Father, we pray that today you would anchor our understanding of this blessed Jesus deep in our hearts, one who is both the powerful author of life and one who is the compassionate, caring human spirit, wraps his arms around us and knows what it's like and cares. And may you use that knowledge, Lord, to encourage us, to give us hope, to enable us to live, as Paul would say, live even as we're dying. And through that, May you, as you were in this story, be glorified in the eyes of all who see. For we pray it all in his precious and powerful name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and sing the last place? Because
Especially, thank you for bringing the word for us today. Appreciate you being here. If you're online, especially thank you as well for being here with us. And if you hope you stick around for just a few minutes, we have something to share with you. Have a great week and God bless.